by all by now we all will have met in some capacity or another our speaker for today, our keynote speaker, Dionysius Agus. Um, but now I'll tell you why he's here and who he is. He's a fellow at the British Academy, Emeritus Al Qasimi Professor of Arabic Studies and Islamic Material Culture at the University of Exeter, and now an adjunct professor at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. Dr. Agus was uh, educated at the Jesuit Université San Joseph in Beirut and at the University of Toronto. He's an ethnographer and linguist specializing in traditional wooden sea craft, the people of the sea, and their material culture in the Western Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean from classical periods to modern times. And just so we know just how much he's engaged in this part of the world, these are some of his books. In the Wake of the Dull, Seafaring in the Arabian Gulf and Amen, Classical Ships of Islam, and another one that is yet forthcoming with Ivy Taurus and uh, Bloomsbury, The Life of the Red Sea Dull. So now you know why we brought him here. And please uh, welcome with me Dr. Dionysius Agus. It was a good introduction today. <laughs> sea stories in medieval Islam are relatively understudied. They are compared to the past and they are more literary Arabic works of different genres. They are written in a simple vernacular style and would appear at various glance to have little to offer beyond entertainment value. However, a closer look to them at them can yield insights into the maritime culture and sea law of the early medieval Islam in the Mediterranean. Sorry, in the Indian Ocean. And the sharing of such sea law with neighboring cultures and civilizations and the wider world. When I conducted fieldwork in the Arabian Gulf and Oman several years ago, I collected a number of personal <coughs> stories from mariners, very diverse, and fishermen. Admittedly, although much of what was recounted had an element of truth based on experience and skills, there was also an element of exaggeration, of embellishment in the narratives. Some of these, some of their stories, in part or in whole, are included in my book, Seafaring in the Arabian Gulf and Oman, the people of the Gulf. The whole idea was to capture the voices of mariners in their different activities, in their experience out at sea. There were in the stories sea creatures never seen before, pirates that jumped on board and threatened to kill the crew, gales and storms witnessing the abyss of the ocean, and jinn, evil spirits which guided the ship to destruction. Such stories, I found later, had a parallel to those related by travelers of the early modern, modern and medieval periods. Remarkably, there is a collection of some stories called The Marvels of India, which was written in the 10th century. In this unique collection of six stories that I'm going to talk about today, although the title contains the name India, the stories are not about India, but perhaps reflect the centrality in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. India brings maritime communities of the Indian Ocean together in the 
Chicago Pilgrim ships drop or weigh anchor at various ports. I would like to begin with a few words about the medieval words of maritime culture before coming to this uh, marvelous of India, its authorship and provenance and the author and the process. <coughs> A description will follow on the landscape and seascape of the region where the stories were collected and where the, what the stories entailed. <coughs> one of the stories narrated by is one by the ship owner al -Bakhdi. I will end with a discussion, reflections on the genre of sea stories and the unique collection of the marvelous stories in the literature. Early maritime works were written to offer information on sea trade routes, navigation, description of landscape and seascape, imported and exported goods, as well as commenting on the customs and traditions of the coastal peoples. The early maritime works, Akbar al Hind was seen, Views on India and China, Silsala of Tarawi, Tawarikh, Chain of Miracles, and Ajay al Hind, Marvels of India. The first two are travel accounts of geographical context, physical and human with information on maritime activity in the Indian Ocean, from Basra, Serat, or Sahar, the Red Sea, in Africa, to India and China. The author of the original, Akbar Sin, is not known, but the book was re-edited by a merchant, Abu Zayd al-Sirafi. The second one, the accounts of the Silsila were collected by Sulaiman Tajir, Sulaiman Merchant, both connected to the medieval port of Sirah. For the third one, Raja ibn Hain, the Marabits of India, has been attributed to Buzur ibn Shahriyar. But the question is the question of its origin will come later in this presentation. The significance of these three maritime works is that they are the earliest known examples of the distinctive sub-genre of medieval Arabic literature. All three works were published in the 9th and 10th centuries. The Marvels of India contains 136 sea stories, many of which center on the lives of mariners who ventured into the open sea as far, indeed, as Sumatra, Java, and China. They are a collection of disparate sea stories with no particular structure of theme connecting them. The particular subgenre of medieval Arabic literature to which these stories belong is called Ajab, the word for marvels, wonders, curiosities. They are often narrated with a touch of ironic humor and with an element of exaggeration for effect, making them similar in many ways in content and style to the tales of the seven voyages of Sinbad the Sailor in the Arabian Nights, where the listener or reader is lost in wonder at the stories of exploration, treasure hunting, and discovery. In the words of one modern day traveler, every returning ship seemed to bring back fresh and ever more bizarre curiosities. And every departure was packed with ever ambitious dreams. To note that the marvels prepared to be factual stories, building on a chain of authorities by Islam. But their content would suggest otherwise. While the stories of Sinbad are presumed to be fiction. 
it is entirely probable that they were embroideries of earlier factory accounts. And you stand here at crossroads between cultural history and fiction. These stories may well contain underlying information of use, not to the literature person, but to the historian, even to the archaeologist. So, what do the sea stories of the marvels of India entail? The stories contain <coughs> tales witnessed by mariners, merchants, and travelers, embarking on cargo ships, sailing to distant lands for trade. They recount stories about how they survived storms and shipwrecks, their encounters with the spirits and sea creatures and other experiences of marvels and wonders. The stories are about the Indian Ocean, which is divided into the seven seas. This is the classic of civilization. The Sea of Zanj, with reference to the Africans, East Africa. The Sea of Lar, the Arabian Sea. The Sea of Harkan, the Bay of Bengal. The Sea of Kalahbar, west coast of Maraya. The Sea of Salahit, Sumatra. The Sea of Kartanj, between the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. And the Sea of Sanji, China, South Asia. Countries are grouped according to the trade commodities that they were known for. So East Africa, the land of Zanj, known for ivory and slaves. The countries around the southern Arabian coast were referred to as the land of incense. India, the land of pepper. Sumatra, Java, Malaya were the land of gold. And Moluccas were known as the spice <coughs> Until some years ago, the marvels were attributed to Buzurk ibn Shahriyar of Ram Hormuz, uh, it's a town in the uh, province of Khuzistan, southwest Iran. It is alleged that he was a sea captain. He lived in Sirat on the Iranian coast. He had, however, no date for his birth, no date for his death. From a few dates in the stories, we can gather that they were collected in the 10th century. But recently, it came to light that the marvelous authorship is actually not Muslim, but one who came from Siraf and lived in Egypt in 1870. His name was Abu Imran Musa ibn Rabah al Ausi. Extract of similar stories by Al Ausi were found in a later work in the 14th century by an encyclopedist, Al Oman. So how did this name, Buzurk, came to be about? According to a study conducted by Jean Charles Dussel, his name was not recorded by Buzurk himself, but was added to an Istanbul manuscript, Aya Sophia 3300, leading us to understand that Buzurk have been apocryphal. Whether real or fictional, both Buzurk and Al Ausi came from or lived in Siraf, which is at the center of the story. Siraf was a prosperous port, as is evident from written medieval Arabic sources, located roughly opposite Bahrain Islands in the Arabian Persian. It was connected diagonally with mainland Shiraz in the 10th century map. This is chosen. Siraf 
today lies in ruins. It was the gateway to China. Indeed, all sea routes to and from China connected with the Red Sea in East Africa. Excavations in Seraf show an active port from the Sasanian period to the Black Sea, with a fort, palatial residences, mosques, and buildings. The ship Graffito is but a memory of that seafaring past. It is evident from medieval Arabic accounts that the sea route was much preferred to the land route by the civilization. Most of the maritime trade was transferred to Sirah, Suhar, on the Oman coast. Two geographers of the 10th century, Al Istakhri and Al Maktisi, visited the port city in the second half of the century. Both were impressed by the beauty and its affluent population. The historian of Mas'udi describes a number of mariners and merchants from the Indian Ocean gathering in Sinaf. This information about maritime activities in Sinaf is also mentioned in the Mahdi's In terms of wealth, Sinaf was the rival of Basra, you can imagine, in those, in those years connected with Baghdad. Its size and its splendor are distinctly famous. Nearly equal to Shiraz, Wahidiyah to Qarib Shiraz. And Al Magdisi could not help but comment on the charm of this city. I have not seen in the realm of Islam more remarkable buildings than those of Shiraz. Mara Aitu in Islam Ahja in the The heyday of Shiraz was during the early decades of the Buddha. Dynasty in the 11th century. There was a decline in the population. Maritime people left, went to Sohar, went to Aden, went to Jeddah, went to West Indian coast. Trade declined, and it was not clear as to what brought the end of Sirah whether it was precipitated by an earthquake, natural disaster. But its fame was echoed for many centuries later into this very day. Sirafi mar mariners are described by the geographer Sahi as men who passed their whole lifetime on the ship. Al Masudi met many of these Sirafi skippers on voyages to West India, East Africa, and China. He says that they were the most knowledgeable and experienced of long distant voyagers. Although he does not comment about their lives or achievements, it is understood that they were skippers of some fame. Otherwise, he would have not mentioned them. And the number of stories about Serafi mariners found in the Marvels of India exemplifies the heroism these people had shown in braving the seas of Arabia and China. The Marvels sea stories are eyewitness accounts of what the historians and geographers have reported on Zirah, prosperous days, and its families. They captured their lives at sea crystallizing that moment in time. Siraf and its mariners may have disappeared, but the stories continue to live. The marvels of India, like the Sinbad stories, were collected with an aim to entertain, but also to instruct, as many, many were narrated connecting events and people. Often, fortune turns to misfortune, but ending with a moral. 
There is a pattern of marvel and mystery, long distance journeys, fire and volcano eruptions and shipwrecks, search for gold, ivory and precious stones, encounter with the unexpected, besieging monsters and giants. What captivated the audience was hearing about the magic, experiencing the unknown, and escaping to a different world reassuring expectation that the main character would return back to normality. One such story was that of the sea captain Abhara. Abhara, an extraordinary man who progressed from shepherd in the desert to fisherman. Then he became a sailor. Then he became a skipper sailing from Siraf to India and China. Abha's, Abhara's story was meant to be an example of one sea captain with much sailing experience and foresight. He sailed to China seven times, prompting the narrator to comment. Only adventurous men had made this voyage before. No one had done it without an accident. Within a man which child, without buying on the way, it was already a miracle. Returning safe and sound was unheard of. I have never heard tell of anyone except him, Abhara, who had made the two voyages there and back without disaster. The storyteller is making important point. The journey to China was not without hazard, but often disaster befell the voyagers, whether from the forces of nature or human aggression or weakness. Here is a story retold by a ship owner, Abu Zahr al -Barka about a fellow shipmaster, a passenger and crew, who experienced just such a disaster on their way to China. The calamity was purely human in origin, and this is what happened. The storyteller engages his listeners <coughs> by telling them that al Barkhari was truly a man of integrity, worthy of respect. He was indeed a man that everyone took heed to. Every man took heed to, to what he said, and therefore the story is worth telling and worth believing. The story is about the island of women. Intrigued the audience The ship carried a number of merchants of diverse ethnic, religious, and linguistic backgrounds who, in the course of their voyage from Siraf to China, faced the violence of the gale in a sea that boiled, beaten about by frightening waves, on a ship that leapt and plunged, and shuddered and trembled. Each merchant in fear prayed according to his religion for surrendering themselves to God. The narrator, looking at the audience, he tells them that the ship was about to founder, not because of the waves and winds, if you tell me, but because the negligence of the crew and the state of the rigging The narrator here pauses as the silent audience waits in suspense. Then on the third day, the passengers 
and crew experienced an even more frightening sight. The ship was approaching a fire that spread over the whole horizon. They preferred to die rather than to witness the suffering of each one of them. <clears throat> Once more, the audience fell in silence until the narrator continued with the story. There was on board the ship an old man of Kadir from Islamic Spain who was hiding all through the voyage from Zerat to China. He was being fed by a sailor, but actually this sailor believed that a guardian angel was eating the food and drinking the water and was not aware of the man in hiding. He believed that by feeding the angel, the ship would be protected against disaster. When the old man of Kadir saw the danger of the ship and the state of fear of all those concerned, he came out from the hiding. Some sailors saw the man and they were bewildered and were shaken by how he appeared from nowhere. He was taken to the captain. After some time arguing about how and what, the old man silenced everyone and reassured them that there was nothing to worry about. Because by the grace of God, you will be saved. What you see is an island bordered and encircled by mountains on which the ocean waves hurl themselves. During the night, this produces the effect of an enormous fire, which frightens you. Sunlight. This illusion is He reassured them, fear not, all men are saved. This brought joy to the passengers and crew. In the following days, when, they all, when all was calm, they approached the island. They all disembarked and threw themselves on the sand and rolled in the light on the ground. But the tragedy was yet to unfold. This island was inhabited by ferocious women who fell upon each one of the crew and passengers and used them for their pleasure. Sadly, all the men died of exhaustion one after the other. The old man of Kadith, however, was taken away by one woman and treated kindly. And together they escaped on the ship's boat and reached the port where the ship had come. She became a Muslim, gave him several children, and they lived. There are four parts in this story. The first is presenting facts about the narrator, al barqati the ship owner. He was a major, converted to Islam. We are also given details about the ship sailing to China, its merchants, the different backgrounds, the crew, and their nautical skills. The second feature is the embellishment of the story with marvelous curiosities and surprises, such as the storm at sea, the fire blazing in the horizon island of women, the tragic death of the passengers and crew. Thirdly, the hero of the story, the man of God. And fourthly, the mother, the only one to survive the catastrophe was the old man, who seems to have had divine guidance that the ship will not be lost in spite of the incompetent crew who did not handle the rigging properly. While both crew and passengers allow themselves to be overcome by the sexually ferocious women, leaving the men of Kadith and his Muslim converted wife to sail off into the sunset. This story is gone. 
and I will not go into the details, but we'll get, get a, what is it that we can gather from this day is <coughs> first the actual information navigating the route of sun through the channel. The hazards of the Malay seas, the nautical skills of the of the skipper boats and so on, and the sails and rigging. A skipper was guided by stars. Al Barhati, Al Barhati's fellow shipman speaks of this canopies. We are at the wind of the wind and the waves, he says. Worst of all, there is that fire we are running towards, and that already fills the horizon. We would rather, we would rather be calm than burn. The stars guide and navigate us, and they still do up to this very day, especially the interviews in the Red Sea. And they warn voyagers of climatic change. They warn voyagers of storms and gales. Some are believed to be symbolic of something to happen on this canopy. Certainly in this story, the canopy signified abandon all hope of return. But the fact <coughs> is a trust in the man Another factual information is that the skipper takes an oath not to expose a ship to loss. All us captains, when we board the ship, stake our lives and destiny on it. If the ship is safe, we remain alive. If it is lost, we die. The code of practice, it is one of the 12 principles of navigation recorded by Ahmed in his book, Ajab al Fawadi, a book of practice in navigation. Second, we have the human interaction with nature and culture. Here, yeah. the state of fear the people experience by the violence of the game and the approaching blood and fire, the superstition of the belief in a guardian angel protecting the ship from destruction and the deliverance that it will happen. So it was a real thing. The Zoroastrian worship of fire. Praying together according to one's religion. There was a Muslim, Buddhist, <coughs> the men becoming tools of the women's passion, and the old man and the young world. Sea stories in the marvels of India are the earliest examples of the subtle genre of Ajaka. In maritime and medieval Arabic literature, they are unique in that no collection of sea stories, with the exception of the seven voyages of Sindhu the Sailor, has appeared since. But it is important to note that the Sindhu voyages are only a part of the Arabian Nights, which is largely. Although the marvels of India, sea stories, fall within the Ajayi theme of wonders and marvels, they offer a wealth of information on diverse subjects that are both instructive and entertaining, touching on the human element of life by and at sea, to the moral lot of the end of some stories. The marvels are written in Arabic representing a diversity of ethnic and religious and linguistic communities in the notion. Their background may contain facts about the port cities, seals, trade goods, and they often demonstrate a commonality of practices in seafaring navigation throughout the Indian Ocean. These stories have obviously developed from the oral culture, which would have been recounted again and again. They bond communities together about events that they share. They came to be written down as a way of solidifying the past, enabling the stories to live the We find 
parallel themes of these sea stories in the Sanskrit and Persian tradition. And indeed, in the West, there is a striking similarity between the story of the island of women in the marvels of India and Homer's, Homer's Odyssey, where the women play the roles of seductresses, such as the goddess Circe, who lived in the island of Aea, and the goddess Calypso on the island of Ogygia, who both seduced Odysseus away from his return to his home and his wife. In the margins of India, the theme of the island of women is taken into a more darker, extreme, and tragic consequences for the animals. The apocryphal acts of Andrew in the Christian Bible tradition portray scenes of shipwrecks, pirates, and cannibals. Such stories were known in the early Christians by the early Christians of Africa, Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor, and other uh, places. They run parallel to sea stories of the Arabian, Persian, and Indian cultures. And although it may be argued that they have influenced each other, it could be that they have risen independently of each other. The Ajaib literature is a genre which pervades in early and medieval times. It is important to note that the Quran is one of God's marvels and that extraordinary things were the signs of God's creative power. The marvel of God's creation was then a pious act. The marvel stories are written in mixed literary and vernacular style of Arabic, thus breaking away from the canon of a good Arabic literary style, which was the norm for any Arabic literary work of Britain. The Marvels and the Arabian Nights stories follow this big style, and there is even for the other collection of stories of Ajayi, Tales of the Marvels. Such stories were memorized and then narrated to the common people in markets, khans in places of rest. In doing so, the storyteller may have felt freer to improvise rather than stick to the flexible, <coughs> inflexible written story. The mixed style of this story is thus a reflection of the older origin. But the older culture is dynamic, a written record of this culture connects. Men of literature, historians, geographers, travelers have given us a few scattered examples of maritime stories. And there are hints that there may have been more, many more, but sadly they are lost according to the Nine which makes the marvels of India such a joy, such a joy not only to be enjoyed for the narratives and to enjoy by us. But also for the researcher looking for nuggets of information on the social cultural history of the town. They are indeed a unique source. <coughs> my dear audience, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Like he's written the wonders himself. Yes. The fiction, the, 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 the play between fictionality and fact, and the bringing back of the curiosities from other parts of the world. And acting on them, and also, and also, in fact, telling the story to them. The performer. Any comments? Any other comments? Beyond this, what can we say? <laughs> Very hard, yes.
Well, uh, this is a comment from India in regard to the table account uh, of uh, designated as the Ajayabul name. Of course, it would have a, a legacy of such taxes as the Shahriyar, and even before the Al Layla wa Layla, which was basically based on Hazar Asana, and again, that was based on so, so many things from India in the context of Ajayabi and Sarayabi. Two things are very striking. Uh, in terms of the accounts that uh, could be related geographically to the Indian coast, have there been some efforts in this regard so that it's not simply the fiction, rather it is related to the fact, number one. Number two, what have been the possible uh, relationships between uh, the accounts in Ajayabal Hind with those that we find in the al plata Valera, especially in this Indian context? Yes, that is true. Except the two, two main points, physically. Um, yes, the names uh, of ports uh, are factual, um, but not only India, by the way. This is why what, what's interesting that it's, it, you have Southeast Asia and up to even China. Um, and the, of course, the, the, the commonality with the Arabian Nights, which mentions a number of, of, of islands and, and uh, ports. Yes. Yeah. A lot of it, of this tradition, is of course Sanskrit and Persian, and, and uh, uh, it came down to Arabic um, uh, later, of course, when it's Arabic became Yuri But thank you, thank you. In literary texts of the ancient times of seafaring, there's very much about Umina, and uh, you could have known better if you have. Uh, uh, um, if you have seen this sign, or if you have, have taken this sign into consideration, is this uh, of any importance to these texts as well? So by starting the cruise, there's some li uh, light signal which uh, say, which might sign to the later development that there is a, a catastrophe ahead or something like this. Or are they utterly surprised? So okay, that's an interesting. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not aware of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're but, talking about other stories. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's very important in the, uh, ancient times. You could have known this because Omina are even today of great importance. You, uh, on which side to spit, on which side to stand, etc., is of great importance to seafaring up to today. So, uh, how did they wa want to prepare for the travel by some. Uh, uh, some uh, gestures, uh, habits, or something they made to uh, made to to secure uh, secure travel. Yeah. Are we, are we talking fact factually? No, no, no. Yeah, uh, uh, it's but the the, of factual, the, uh, the the customs are factual, but uh, the literary text make uh, makes something out of it as, as well, which is purely fictional. So there is a crow. Coming, yeah. uh, coming from from heavens or something. He's flying from le uh, right to left. Yeah, everybody knows that you don't have to get, get on the journey I, when there's a crow flying. Or I, I, get, I get about no. Yeah. As far as I know, from the stories that I have read, yeah. uh, I've read them a few times. Uh, yeah. went through that. This element of surprise is much more common. Okay. Than, but that, that's a good answer. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering. Uh, you mentioned. From the text, the very incidents that happened during the travel on sea, mm -hmm. sea. but uh, I mean that kind has been occupied by the, the existence of the sea travel itself, the crusade to be on a ship. And you mentioned the Quran also, and there are Quranic references between the two types of traveling: travel by land, travel by sea. Yes. Is there anything in the text that you read that this? Describes the particularity of the travel by sea in this kind of uh, general way. Um, Specifically in the stories, to some extent, yes, yes. I mean, um, as opposed to traveling by land. Yeah. Well, the, the, well, all the stories are. At the <coughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that the, the travel at, at sea or travel by sea as such has been a symbol for a way of being, a way of living. Of living, yeah. Uh, yes, 
Yes, it's mentioned uh, by, by not not in the Ajayi, mm -hmm. but by historians or geographers like Al Istakhri. So you you could by your experience, what would you say is the particularity of sacrifice to you? Um, is it virtuous? <laughs> um, in what sense? Uh, my experience, in other words, you know, the and if, if you take the ship as a symbol of the way of going through life, uh, as a voyage, a particular type of voyage, uh, so how would you distinguish that from travel by land? Or what is the particularity of it? Um, we're not talking philosophically over here, we're talking <laughs> factually. Because I, I have to be careful not to... Not the, question, the question is coming from a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, because I mean, I, there, there's something... Um, there were many advantages by traveling by sea, mm -hmm. as opposed to by land. Mm -hmm. uh, sea was shorter. The distances were shorter. shorter. By land, you had problems, you know, Problems of, of heat, um, problems of, of marauding, uh, bad winds, um, uh, length, you know, distance. While the sea worked with the monsoonal winds, so which worked uh, in a six-month cycle. So there were many benefits. Um, but that didn't mean that they were not um, hazardous. They were, as you have seen from the stories. Yeah, I mean, there's something, there's something there, but I, 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 I <coughs> this is quite interesting because, uh, from an interior perspective, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, the other way around. The land is more safe, and you can go from city to city, and everything is fine. When you're on the sea, you are highly dependent on the gods. And if, if they want you to die, you die. But, but you can't do anything uh, on your own. If the gods want you to die, yeah. it's that way. So it's completely the other way around. The, the way by land was uh, well, really marked as the same I, way. I think you'll be surprised to, to know yeah. that going by land, they were worried. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, 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 they wasn't safe. In, in, in neither way was safe, neither but, way, but, neither but, but uh, the, um, uh, there was a feeling that you could do more on your own when you were by land. You, can, you, you, could, prepare, you, you could prepare for thieves or robbers or anything like this yeah. by taking men into uh, account or, or getting extra guards, but on sea when the storm comes, what can you do? Yeah. You, you are completely, uh, you are completely yeah. lost. Yeah. So yeah. this is the difference. Uh, yes, yes. 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 I don't know. Very true. Very true. Sorry. Um, I think that um, the most important aspect of this type of stories is the invention of danger. It's more inventing danger than danger itself. <coughs> and then this is for the sake of creating the hero, which you said by the end. I mean, you, you provided us with several aspects. And it looks like uh, the colonial uh, adventure stories also uh, built later on in the 19th century. I'm speaking, for example, about uh, English, uh, the English yarn later on. Built a lot on this uh, aspect of inventing danger. So it can be the, if it's not the weather, then it is uh, women. It's mainly women. Women are also a major source of danger, mm. as uh, you, it's always this uh, engulfing woman uh, type of, uh, uh, I mean, woman dentata, okay, mm. which engulfs enticing women, which should be subdued, and mm. uh, I mean, this is what happens in like yeah. story. I mean, it's a very, very interesting perspective. I don't, I don't, uh, how do you say, I don't subscribe to it 100%, mm -hmm. but there is some element of it, I agree with you. Um, but the, 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 the danger, there was danger, believe me. When you hear the stories, in my book, uh, Seafaring in the Arabian, uh, people that told the stories, you know, uh, especially the pearl divers and so on, the danger was incredible. Yeah. Uh, unexpected, you know, uh, gales, unexpected winds, uh, currents, and shipwrecks, you hear so many times of pounding of, of 
chips of dollars. So uh, you were a bit too, too cruel to say that they, <laughs> that they invented. No, but yes, uh, natural dangers are there. I mean, storms and all. We believe for, in that. Don't but forget that there's the element of entertainment. For the sake of narrative. You have to come up with some exaggeration. Yeah. Okay. But seamen do exaggerate. Mm. Yes. Yeah, they like that. <laughs> they love it. Uh, to what extent is uh, theological thought reflected in these stories? For example, kada or predestination by God. I mean, you have to ship, uh, shipwreck because God yeah. predestined it. So is there a notion of theological thought in these stories, or are they only entertainment? Folk, 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 folk theology, if you want to call it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, popular, I know what you mean. popular beliefs. Popular beliefs. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yes, but yes, mainly popular beliefs. And superstition is very strong. In Mishizi, you yeah. always have the scene of the storm, and you always like there is um, uh, famous stories about many Yusak, they call them Nasik, Zahid in the ship, like the um, and uh, especially there was like a story about Abraham, like there was a, a, a sage with them in the ship and he started praying in order to save the ship from the storm and the. Uh, the scene of the clouds that they started like to, to, to extend their tongues to move the ship yeah, everywhere. Yeah, wow, wow. So there was an element of exaggeration. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah. Which, which one is the the alwais? Yeah. And thank you very much for that. Do we have examples in the Ajaib the things of piracy? Um, yes. Yes. Um, the identity of the pirates is clear. It's Where Indian, come in, from? Indian mainly. Indian. Indian, yeah. They were famous uh, uh, to respect this. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they were authorities. Eh? Which, which side of the coast? Uh, on from? the West Indian coast, but also up to Sokotra, even to the Red Sea. Ah. They are mentioned. Um, and with the decline of um, Sirah, does no. anything, I mean, Historical question: <coughs> With the decline of Sirach, does another hub appear um, that sort of uh, takes over that yeah. that function? Because presumably maritime travel did not end yeah. with the decline of Sirach. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything about that? <coughs> you know these these sea stories are really, up to this very day. There is no collection of sea stories. There is a job you could do. Many, right? many, yeah. <laughs> because this has perpetuated the idea that Arabs are not sailors. Yeah. But clearly, yes. we have a, yes. uh, early yeah. evidence yeah. of the fact that they are very much. But what, what, what the Ajayi brings out <coughs> mainly is this cosmopolitan nature, oh, yes. the erosion of the Indian Ocean called Western and Eastern. It's amazing. <laughs> it, it, it describes Islam at the time, you know, that Islam was cosmopolitan. Muslim and non-Muslim, often, often living in harmony. That's what I was preaching in Bahrain. They like that. If only we go back to those times when we yes. lived in harmony. Yes. So unfortunately, in many uh, ethnographical accounts that we find in our Jaguli, and also the Halifa Al-Qaeda Sirati, they have uh, totally based on the VRCs and uh, and oh, the, oh, yeah, some oral tradition for that. Yeah. And they must have been corrected in some foreign studies. Yeah. Uh, just I recollect one example, uh, because I just recollect the text of Abdullah Sirafi. Uh, he mentions about uh, the illicit relationship between men and women in India, and uh, prescribes a particular uh, uh, punishment that is usually carried out, which is actually incorrect. For example, burning is an such types of traditions have never been part of the Indian society. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is where the historian, yeah. uh, and of course the archaeologists come in. You know, so look at Sirach. <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, there is, um, once the questions finish, I'll just tell you about the story of the boy. Okay, yeah. according. According to the Ajayi, they had a you know, usual story, abandoned ship, etc., etc. So 
the one that went on the ship's boat, small, you know, 12 of them. And there was this fat boy, quite clumpy, among them. He was what they called the cabin boy. And they were rowing, rowing, and one day, two days rowing to go to an island. And they were all there, you know, getting weaker and weaker, you know. Fourth day, they were still rowing, and the eyes of the seamen fell on this boy. And this boy was rolling his eyes. Until suddenly, this boy turned his face, and he said, land, land. <laughs> and it ends there. Right. The whole thing is that they were going to eat yeah, the yes. but <laughs> it ain't tasty. <laughs> so that's nice and entertaining, but also a little more. Yeah. Well, if there are no more comments, then we can perhaps break for coffee. And I would like to thank very much Dr. Bruce for coming in. Tying together the comments.